Well, hello there, my friend. All the very, very best. Today we're continuing our conversation about some of the fascinating characters who walked with God. They walked with God. And we're exploring what we can learn from these people who walked alongside our Maker. By the way, I hope you'll let us know how we can be praying for you. Just post your prayer needs on the page. If you're going through a tough time, we'd be honored. We'd be honored to lift up your name before God and ask Him to remind you that God has a promise for you. The promise begins with this phrase, Weeping may last through the night. Psalm 30 and verse 5. Of course, you knew that much. You didn't need to read the verse to know that truth. Weeping can last through the night. Just ask the widow in the cemetery. Ask the mother in the emergency room. Ask the man who lost his job. He can tell you. So can the teenager who lost her way. Weeping may last through the night. And the next. And the next. That's not new news to you, but this may be. Joy comes with the morning, Psalm 30 and verse 5. Despair will not rule the day. Sorrow will not last forever. The clouds may eclipse the sun, but they cannot eliminate it. Night might delay the dawn, but it cannot defeat it. Morning comes, not as quickly as we want, not as dramatically as we desire, but morning comes, and with it, comes joy. Do you need this promise? Have you wept a river? Have you forsaken all hope? Do you wonder if a morning will ever bring this night to an end? Mary Magdalene did. In the forest of the New Testament, she's the weeping willow. She is the one upon whom tragedy cast its harshest winter. Before she knew Jesus, the scripture says in Luke 8 and verse 2 that she had, se she had seven demons. She was a prisoner of seven afflictions. Depression, loneliness, shame, fear, perhaps. We aren't told the list. Maybe she was a recluse. Maybe she was a prostitute. Maybe she had been abused or abandoned. You know the number seven is sometimes used in the Bible to describe completeness. It, it could be that Mary Magdalene was completely consumed with troubles. But then something happened. Jesus happened. Jesus stepped into her world. He spoke, and the demons fled. And for the first time in a long time, the oppressive forces were lifted, banished, evicted. Mary Magdalene could, well, she could sleep well. She could eat enough. She could smile again. And the face in the mirror wasn't anguished. Jesus restored life to her life. And, and she reciprocated. She was among the first uh, female followers of Christ who were regularly com con contributing from their own resources to support Jesus. You'll, you'll find that in Luke 8 and verse 3. Wherever Jesus went, Mary Magdalene followed. She heard him teach. She saw him perform miracles. She helped him. She helped pay the way. She helped pay expenses. She may have even prepared meals, but she was always near Christ, even, even at his crucifixion. The scripture says she stood near the cross, John 19 and verse 25. When they pounded the nails in his hands, she heard the hammer. When they pierced the side, she saw the flow of blood. When they lowered his body from the cross, she was there. She was there to help prepare it for burial. On Friday, Mary Magdalene watched Jesus die. On Saturday, she observed a sad Sabbath. And when Sunday came, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb to finish the work that she had begun on Friday. John chapter 20 and verse 1. Early on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb while it was still dark. Now she knew nothing of the empty tomb. She came with no other motive except to wash the remaining clots of blood from the beard of her master and say goodbye. It was a dark morning. And when she arrived at the tomb, 
things went from bad to worse. Mary Magdalene saw that the stone had been taken away. Assuming that grave robbers had taken the body, she hurried back and she found Peter and John. And she told them. The scripture says, she said, they have taken the Lord from the tomb, she told them in verse 2. So Peter and John ran to the gravesite. John was faster, but Peter was bolder. He stepped inside. John followed him. Peter saw the empty slab and stared, but John saw the empty slab and he believed. And Easter had its first celebrant. Peter and John hurried to tell the others. We expect the camera lens of the gospel to follow them, don't we? After all, they were apostles, future authors of epistles. They composed two-thirds of the inner circle. We expect John to describe what the apostles did next, but he doesn't. He tells the story of the one who remained behind. Again, John 20. But Mary stood outside the tomb weeping. Verse 11, her face was awash with tears. Her shoulders heaved with sobs. She felt all alone. It was just Mary, Mary Magdalene, and her despair and a vacant tomb. As she wept, she stooped down and she looked into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. Then they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Verses 11 through 13. Mary Magdalene mistook the angels for men. It's easy to understand why. I mean, it was still dark outside, even darker inside the tomb. Her eyes were tear-filled. She had no reason to think angels would be in the tomb. Bone diggers, perhaps. Caretakers, possibly. But her Sunday was too dark to expect the presence of angels. She said, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Verse 13. Mary's world had officially hit rock bottom. Her master murdered, his body buried in a borrowed grave, his tomb robbed, his body stolen. Now two strangers were sitting on the slab where his body had been laid. Sorrow intermingled with anger. You ever had a moment like this? A moment in which bad news became worse. A moment in which sadness it just seemed to wrap itself around you like a fog. and it, In which you came looking for God, yet you could not find Him. Maybe Mary Magdalene's story is your story. If so... You're going to love what happened next. In the midst of Mary's darkest moment, the sun came out, reading again. Now when she had said this, she turned around and she saw Jesus standing there and did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? She, supposing him to be the gardener, said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will, I will take him away. Now, she didn't recognize her Lord, so Jesus did something about it. He called her by name. Jesus said to her, and this is verse 16, Jesus said to her, Mary, maybe it was the way he said it, the tone, the accent, Maybe, maybe it was the memory associated with it, the moment she first heard someone say her name unladen with perversion or an agenda. Mary, when she heard him call her by name, she knew the source. She turned and said to him, Rabboni, which is to say teacher, in a second, in the pivot of the neck in the amount of time it took her to rotate her head from this side to that her world went from a dead Jesus to a living one weeping may last through the night but joy 
She took hold of them. We know this to be true because of the next words. Jesus said, Don't hold on to me, because I have not yet gone up to the Father. We're in verse 17 now. Maybe she fell at his feet and held his ankles. Maybe she threw her arms around his shoulders and, and held him close. We don't know how she held him. We just know she did. And Jesus let her do so. Even if the gesture lasted for only a moment, Jesus allowed it. Don't you think this is wonderful? How wonderful that the resurrected Lord was not too holy, too otherly, too divine, too supernatural to be touched. This moment deserves a sacred role in the Easter story. It at once reminds us that Jesus is the conquering king and the good shepherd. He has power over death. But he also has a soft spot for the Mary Magdalene's of the world. The regal hero is relentlessly tender. Then Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord. And she, he had spoken these things to her. To her. To her of all people. Of all people to whom he would have, could have spoken, Jesus went first to her. He had just ripped the gates of hell off their hinges. He had just yanked the fangs out of Satan's mouth. He had just turned B.C. into A.D. for heaven's sake. Jesus was the undisputed king of the universe. 10,000 angels stood in rapt attention, ready to serve. And what was his first act? To whom did he first go? To Mary, the weeping, heartbroken woman who once had seven demons. Why? Why her? As far as we know, she didn't become a missionary. No epistle bears her name. No New Testament story describes her work. Why did Jesus create this moment for Mary Magdalene? Perhaps to send this message to all heavy-hearted people. Weeping may last through the night, but joy comes with the morning. Weeping comes. It comes to all of us. Heartache leaves us tear-streaked, heartbroken. Weeping comes, but so does joy. Darkness comes, but so does the morning. Sadness comes, but so does hope. Sorrow may have the night, my friend, but it cannot have our lives. Am I talking to someone who feels that God is talking to you? If so, please listen to him. This world can be so hard on us, but don't give up. Just as the sun came then, the sun comes still. Weeping may last for the night, but joy comes with the morning.